Dino, the piano player, did a uh, rendition of Battle Hymn of the Republic. And uh, he added a lot of warrior type things to that song. I like it. So, anyway, if you look at the date that that song was written, um, that Civil War era. And there was a sentiment uh, during that war that the devil, Satan himself, was trying to tear our union apart. And believe it or not, I've read the letter, an actual letter written by Jefferson Davis, the president of the confederacy where he is asking the pope to step in and help the south win the battle okay that's his that's history and I, there was a sentiment that the devil was literally trying to tear the united states apart and that they felt that God would eventually give the Union the victory. And he did. He kept the Union of the states together through, through a terrible war. You're talking about brethren fighting brethren. And uh, if you go back and actually look at and read things about the Civil War, it was a terrible, it was a terrible war. It was awful. And so, um, God kept our nation together. Will there ever be another one? Could be. A war, Americans fighting Americans. Probably over the Bible. Okay? I don't know. I don't know. We'll wait and see. The devil hates a strong union. Okay? He hates it. He is a conqueror. He is one who divides things and splits things apart. So, um, let's turn to let's turn to Matthew chapter nine. I already took down my projector, so you don't know, you have no idea what I've got up here, do you? Matthew chapter nine. Let's begin there. That's going to be our starting point. We're looking at devils, and so. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on people in the Scriptures, starting with the New Testament, starting with the Gospels, people who were actually possessed with devils. And the question I'm going to ask you tonight is, how do you think that works? How does, that, how does someone get to a state in their life where devils literally take them over possesses them, takes over their thinking, takes over their physical bodies, takes over their mind. What, what does a person, how does the person get to that point where literally a devil inhabits their body? And do you believe that still takes place today? Heavenly Father, well, let's read the scriptures. Matthew 9, verse 32. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man, meaning that he couldn't speak, possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing sickness and every disease among the people. Father, we ask tonight that you give us wisdom, give us sound knowledge and understanding. Help us, Father, in understanding sound doctrine and understanding this Bible, understanding the truth of it. And Father, though we may not physically see with our eyes someone who is brought to such an extent as to where they are possessed of a devil, help us, Father, to understand and discern in our heart the fact that devils are still around, people are still, their lives are inhabited 
by very evil spirits, unclean spirits. And Father, how does a person get to the point to where a devil can just move in and take over that person's mind, their heart, their faculties, their, even the strength of their body? And Father, prepare us for days to come when devil habitation will be become much more prominent, much more seen. And Father, just give us wisdom and open up our eyes to the truth of your word and teach us things, Father, that we'll need. We may not see it today, but who knows what tomorrow will bring. So, Father, just guide us and teach us and give us good lessons, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. I wrote down a couple of places. I was just thinking about this today in my office looking over the lesson, and I want you to look in Luke 22 and John 13. These are the two witnesses in our Bible where Satan, the prince of all the devils, because that's what was mentioned in Matthew, the Pharisees accused Jesus of being possessed himself with the prince of devils. The prince of devils is the devil, Satan. Beelzebub, Belial. Um, Beelzebub, I think, is a, a variation of the name Baal. Beelzebub, Beelzebub. So the name Baal itself means Lord, a prince. And so the prince of devils is Satan, and they accuse Jesus of being inhabited by or being empowered by Satan himself. Be and they did that because they didn't like him. They hated Jesus. They hated his doctrine. They hated who he said that he was. He was a threat to them. And so they accused him of having devils. I get, I'm accused of that. Uh, there's a guy that makes sure I know about all the videos that people make about me. Okay, because he, he sends them to me. And I don't mind that. I really don't. Because there is no such thing as bad publicity. I really, I really mean that because the very people who are the loudest about me and about what I'm saying, what I'm teaching and so on, they mouth out that I'm just, I'm, I'm being paid by the Illuminati, I'm possessed with devils. I'm, I'm not kidding you. I am not kidding you. See these two candles here? My wife put those candles there. A guy made a video, serious as all get out, saying that our church was modeled after a Masonic temple. This was Jachin, this was Boaz, the Masonic pillars, and that white place there, that's a obelisk. I'm not kidding you. And I say, let them make their videos and let them say what they want about me because if there's somebody out there that's never heard, they'll go, yeah, I heard Mike Hoggart is evil. I'm going to go check him out. That's what I want. I want you to do that. I want you to check me out. Okay? I want you to do what um, Brother Taylor said he did for two years. His wife said, you need to watch Mike Hoggart. So he's sitting there for two years with his Bible waiting for me to say something that he knew was wrong biblically. And he was going to go, aha! And for two years he sat and never heard anything. So... Go ahead, make my day. <laughs> Luke 22, 3. Luke 22, did I say that right? Yeah, Luke 22, 3. If we look, let's go to verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief of priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. So verse 3, Satan found his way in. He found the weak link of the chain, as it were. And it was Judas Iscariot. Now, Judas Iscariot, obviously, there has to be a progression of Judas's life that brought him to the place where he is open and willing to allow Satan to inhabit. Think of every, every person's body 
think of that in the terms of it is a house. Because that's how Jesus described it. That's how the apostles describe us, as this is the house that can be inhabited either by God, and if it's not inhabited by God, then it is an open, empty house to be inhabited by a different spirit. So everybody's life is a house looking for a spirit to inhabit it. So Judas didn't just wake up one day and say, you know what, I think I want to follow Satan. If you look at Judas's life, he is always on the fringe of what's going on with Jesus. He is always the last apostle listed. In every list of the disciples, the 12 disciples, Peter's name is always first. Judas is always the last one. Okay, then you see Judas being described, he's numbered with the disciples, but is being described as a thief, he's the one carrying the money bag. In other words, whenever money was donated for the ministry of Jesus and his disciples, Judas was always the one with the bank account, the carrying the bag of silver and gold. And more than likely, because the Bible's giving him the title of a thief, he's reaching into that bag on the side and pocketing the money. So there's just enough in the bag to keep everything going. Judas probably going around with the bag saying, will you please give to the ministry of Jesus Christ? It's almost like he had his own TV ministry. God wants you to give okay, to this vital ministry. And he's the one going around have, taking people's money. Just enough money for the disciples, for their meals, for whatever it is that they need. But Judas was dipping into the bag and pocketing the money. He was the thief, for he carried the bag, the Bible says. So he was the treasurer of the disciples, but he was stealing money out of it. So what is the root of of his evil is the love of money remember what we talked about in Sunday school this morning learning about Satan Satan is involved in merchandise Satan has this thing where he loves and he craves possessions because he says he offers to Jesus see all these kingdoms I own them I will give you all of these kingdoms he is the possessor of human things He's, he's a merchandiser, a marketer. For some reason, Satan loves money. And he wants as much as he can gain. And so, we find uh, in verse 3, Then entered Satan into Judas' surname Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. So, throughout the whole of Judas's life, his whole life seems to be set up for this one particular day. In fact, I know and we know that Jesus picked Judas for this very purpose, did he not? Did not Jesus know when he called Judas, did he not know that he would be the one? Sure he did. He picked him for that reason, knowing that everywhere they went, people's giving money, Judas, of course, carrying that money, knowing how much was in there, knowing what he could get away with stealing on the side. And he's a thief. So the thief opens his life up to the master of all thieves, Satan himself. Satan physically entered into Judas Iscariot and now has taken over Judas. Because look at what, it, look at what happened right after that in verse 4. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray them, betray him unto them, and they were glad and covenanted to give him what? Money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Satan himself, through Judas, bargaining to the chief priest, how much money will you give me if I turn him over to you? So the deal was made, the money was given, 
Judas then saying, I will make sure that there is an opportunity away from all the people that you can take Jesus and nobody will see it happen. That's Judas. Turn to John 13. We see that this takes place at, as Jesus and his disciples are eating the Passover. So my thought, if you want to study this, my thinking is there must be something about the Passover feast and the details of the Passover. If I was to study the Passover itself, going all the way back to the book of Exodus, it seems like you're going to find something that is a foreshadowing of Judas Iscariot in the Passover. I don't know what it is. Um, maybe in the form of the Levite priest who actually takes the Passover lamb and sacrifice. I don't know. But there's got to be something in the Old Testament that foreshadows Satan entering into Judas. I have never thought about that until I was looking at it earlier today. But to me, that's where my mind, I would go study something in the, in the Passover ritual itself. Not, not the Jewish Passover Seder. Do not try to look for it in what the Jews are doing now because the Jewish Passover Seder is about a million miles away from what the scriptures tell them to do. They have, they have injected so many unbiblical traditions into their Passover ceremonies that it doesn't look anything like the book of Exodus. Okay? Them sitting around with a table with an empty plate waiting for Elijah to show up. That's not in the scriptures. That's Jewish tradition. They're waiting. There's a familiar spirit that's calling on, on their houses, knocking at their door, and they're sending the children to go open the door to let this dead spirit in to sit with them. That's not biblical. I don't see that anywhere. So study the scriptures. Anyway, John chapter 13. If we look in um, John chapter 13 itself is the Passover supper. And um, if we look in verse 2 of John 13, supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him at the supper. And then if we look in verse 24, oh, verse 21, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Does anybody know who that is? It's John. That's how John speaks of himself. Okay, he never says in here, I'm the, the closest one. He doesn't say that. He just writes it into the text. There was one leaning on his bosom whom Jesus loved. We know that John shares a special relationship with Jesus. So special that John is the last one to see him on this earth some 90 years later, 80 years, whatever, however long it was from the time Jesus died till John gets the book of Revelation. But John definitely had this close relationship with him. John is the one disciple out of all of them that dies a natural death. Even though they tried to kill him. He's in exile on the Isle of Patmos and the Roman government saying we can't kill him so let's just put him in exile out of the way. That way his influence will be banished away. They didn't know that Jesus himself was going to visit John, give him a vivid description of the end of of all of human history, the book of Revelation. So anyway, verse 24, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. So Peter's asking, John, since you're close to Jesus, ask him who it is. Verse 25, he then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop. What is that? To have the bread, they're going to dip it. It's like biscuits and gravy, okay? Bread 
and whatever juice you cook that stuff, there's nothing better than that. Amen? Dip the bread and clean the plate with the bread. He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Verse 27, and after the sop, Satan entered into him. Why at that time? I don't know. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. They, Jesus had not revealed it. He was like keeping them from it. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast or that he should give something to the poor. He then having received the sop went immediately out and it was night. And of course, we know that Judas then ran right to the, the scribes of Pharisees, the Jewish leadership and said, I'll give him to you, but it's going to cost you. So they gathered 30 pieces of silver, quite a sum of money, gave it to him, and that's how it is. But we have the two witnesses there where Satan himself physically entered into Judas Iscariot. So my question is, uh, let's go to Matthew 12 as, we're, as I'm talking. Matthew 12, what is it in a person's life that opens themselves up to being possessed by an evil, unclean spirit? How does the person get to that point? How deep and dark into debauchery, drunkenness, whoredoms, um, working satanic magic, how does a person get to a point to where they are physically possessed by a devil? Um, the name Sean Sellers. Does that name ring a bell with anybody? Sean Sellers. Who am I talking about? Oklahoma. I was in Oklahoma. When this took place, in fact, I was working at a church. There was a man in the church that he made tombstones. And he showed me the tombstone that he, he had just finished it for Sean Seller's mother and stepfather. Sean was, it was a teenager. One night he just flipped out, murdered his mother, murdered his mother's husband, his stepdad went out and killed a convenience store clerk the same night. They arrested him. He was on trial. He was found guilty of capital murder and was at the time the youngest person ever on death row because Oklahoma had a death penalty and they said, we're going to kill this guy. Sellers, while he was in prison, uh, I guess was converted to Christ and was very open, he did some interviews with different news agencies and so on, very open about the process of being a young teenager, learning wizardry, learning magic, getting into, at the time, fantasy role-playing games, Dungeons and Dragons. That was big in the 80s. It's grown now to where it's now being played by way of computers. You role play in the computer realm. You become a character in that gaming system and you take on, you have magic powers, you do this, you do that, and so on. To me... There are games that are designed specifically to teach young people magic and occult arts. Back in the 80s, it was done with a board, dice, little, you took on the characters and so on. You learned about these characters in Dungeons and Dragons. You learned about that. You read the books about them and so on. But you played these role-playing games and that's where his invitation I guess to allow a devil to possess him because he said just something took over and in that in that night he ends up killing his own mother 
her husband, convenience store clerk. Uh, I'm not, I don't remember much about it. I don't think at the time he was trying to use that as a defense to keep off death row. He was just open and honest about what had happened and the, and the course that he chose for himself in his young life. So, let's look in Matthew 12. These that are possessed with devils, there seems to be something in their life to where they open up to this event. Matthew 12, verse 22, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. That is Satan. That's Lucifer. He's the prince, the chief of all of the evil angels. Remember, there's one third of them that serve a different master. They don't serve God. They follow Satan. Satan is their prince. He's their captain. If he tells them to do something, they go do it. Okay? Uh, we're watching in my office there uh, just different documentaries about the animal kingdom. In every herd, there's a prince. In a lion, what do they call a lion? A den of lions, there is a chief lion in that den. And it's a dominant male. And that dominant male has the rights over all of the lions in that. Now, if, a, another, if another male wants to take over that den... He must kill that prince, that chief, that head lion. And when he does, he will take the, the young cubs that that lion has made and kill every one of them. So that those female lions, when they breed, they are breeding his line. He's not raising another li some other lion's cubs. He's not going to do it. He's going to kill off that bloodline and make... The lions underneath him of his bloodline alone. That's pretty wild, okay? We're, I was watching things about baboons. There's a dominant male among the baboons. And when one of the little juvenile baboons gets out of line, the dominant male, he'll teach him lessons. They are vicious and they're cruel. But that dominant male's in charge of that group. I guess they call that, a, believe it or not, a congress. Okay, a group of baboons, it's called a congress, okay? I know that's funny, yeah, there's a, there's a joke there, there's probably several of them, okay? But the idea is, in just about every group of animals, there's a dominant. It's either a king or a queen, sometimes it's run by a female. But there's always a dominant prince, among those. He's the one that's in charge. And if you get out of line, he'll let you know it. But what, what he says and where he goes and what he does, they have to follow that. So think of it along those lines. In the kingdom of the angels, there is a dominant prince, and his name is Lucifer. Okay? There is also another prince. Turn to Revelation 9. As, here's how I'll say this. As Satan is the prince of the upper realm of evil angels, there is a group of evil angels in the lower realm that have a different king over them. Revelation 9. You can start in... Uh, Verse 7, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. Their faces were as the faces of men, and they had the hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was as the set. That's what I was talking about, those warrior wasps. You got to look into this. You don't go on YouTube and look up warrior wasps. They make a sound, their wings beating on their chest, and it sounds like an army marching down the road. And when I heard that, I thought of this verse. 
The sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Okay? And they had tails like in the scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them. As Satan is the prince of the upper realm of evil angels, this king is the king or the lord or the prince of the lower realm of evil angels. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. He has two names, two different languages, but both of them mean destroyer. Okay, That's his name, the destroyer. And so the lower angels have a prince over them. The higher realm angels have a prince over them. And uh, I guess they're on the same team, but they're all going to get destroyed in the end. Amen? So anyway, back to Matthew 12. Uh, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts. That's because he's the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God always knows what you're thinking, does it not? Okay, because you're reading it and it's like, uh-oh, I just read my own mind here in the Bible. So Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every house or house, every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? Now, it took me a long time to get that, but I get it now. That's how we know his kingdom is not going to stand. It's not going to, he's not going to win. Amen? It's like 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The days of Jehoshaphat, when Jehoshaphat found out the three armies were coming to kill the, the Jews in Jerusalem, they prayed unto God and said, God, we can't fight against them. There's three armies. We can't fight against them. What are we going to do? They're going to kill us all. And God sent word and said, don't worry about it. This battle is mine, not yours. So he said, you go stand on the hill and you sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound of Rock of Ages cleft for me. You go up there and sing songs. And I'll take care of it. And the Bible says that the next day when the battle started, all three armies met in the valley and they all three started killing one another. And by the time, and I would love to see this in a movie, the last two guys shoving swords in each other, falling down at the same time, and all of a sudden now there's nobody left. And the Jews are going. And they've all got all their gold, their shields, their weapons. They're carrying their jewels with them. They're carrying their medals, their prizes. And so the Jews spent days picking through the dead bodies and going through their camp, taking all their stuff because God gave them the spoil. Just let God fight the battle, amen? God will give you the stuff afterwards. That's just how it works. So his kingdom shall not stand. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. He's, tell, he's not telling you that devils all get along so they can prevail. He's telling you that he knows this is how their kingdom is not going to be able to stand. Daniel chapter 2. We have a kingdom. We have several kingdoms. We have four kingdoms in the form of an image. Standing. A standing image. And then he said, uh, and Daniel's given the revelation of this to Nebuchadnezzar. He's telling him what his dream was. And then he said, um, oh, let's see here. Let's get down to verse 40. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron uh, that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. What does that tell you? It's not going to stand. You know, it may be strong as iron, but it's got weakness in it. And the weakness is that they mingled with mankind. That's the weakness. And so verse, uh, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's their mistake. That's their big mistake. Okay, they mingled with mankind. Mankind's weak. 
And, uh, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That's, he's talking about the, uh, the stone. Verse 34, thou sawest till the stone was cut with, cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that, that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Okay? And then it fell and broke into pieces and just blew away at, like dust. That's how we know Satan's kingdom will not stand. Amen? They're not all working together. No honor among thieves. Okay? If you've got ten guys going to rob a bank, nine of those guys are going to get killed at the end of it so the guy can take all the money. Okay? Because they know they can't write up a written contract to rob a bank. It won't be upheld in court. Okay? And I, I'm just, you know, I'm one of these, you know, conspiracy theories. They interest me. But some of them are just so outrageous. Because it assumes that four and a half million people are all in on it. And none of them are telling the secrets. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second, okay? The bigger, you, the more people you have in on a conspiracy, the more likely it's going to fall to pieces and not work. Amen? So that's, he's telling you how Satan's kingdom is going to crumble. It's because these devils and these devils, they don't all get along. And these evil people over here don't all get along with the people over here. And I've said this before, I believe that there are people in this earth who really believe that the best way to save the planet is to kill off about six and a half billion people. Okay? I really believe that that... I have a cousin who works for a company that gets large donations of money to buy land to rid all the humans off of it. It's called rewilding. And he calls himself a professional tree hugger. He is one of these that thinks that man is a disease on the earth and we need to get man off of most places of the earth. So I believe there are people who want that. But I also believe that there are companies like Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, Samsung, who don't want less people on the earth. They want more. Because more people means more computers, more laptops, more tablets, and more cell phones. And more stuff that you're going to buy from Amazon. If they reduce the population of the earth down to 500 million people, those companies would go bankrupt. So you have two opposing theories about what to do on this earth. Kill off all the humans or make as much money off of them as you can. And those two groups are not going to get along. You're not going to convince these five big companies, the five largest companies in the world, that we need to kill off six and a half billion people because then there's just not going to be any more money to be made. You see what I'm saying? They don't all get along and they don't all agree. So, let's make sure that we're not like them. Amen? That doesn't mean we all have to see every. We just have to believe the same Bible. Amen? All right, back to Matthew chapter 12. Jesus spells it out for him in verse 27. He says, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else, how can one enter, enter to a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Now, right here, verse 29, I think is how devils take over. Look at that verse carefully. How else can one enter a strong man's house? Remember the house, their body is a house. Spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man. So think about it. Laura, can I talk about you for a little bit? In public? Maybe. It's going to be, it's going to be okay. You, you have admitted that there were things in your past that were not good, okay? Those were binding you. 
They, the intention was to bind you and to get you into enough bondage so that you didn't have a will of your own anymore. Am I right? Okay. Remember what you was telling me about the parking spot? Can I say that? Okay. She had learned that if you just will certain things, they come to pass. The law of attraction. And she was supposed to meet up with some people every day, and she, there was this one parking spot that she wanted, and on her way there, she would will herself that parking spot. And invariably, when she would pull in there, somebody had just pulled out, and she always got it. She always got that parking spot. Okay? Now, let me tell you what that is. That's spirits working to bind her, to make her think that she really does have powers and that she really can will and desire her way through life. And what they're doing is that they're deceiving her just enough to lock her up. Once she's in bondage, they come in and spoil her house. Make sense? Gamblers. Devils will roll dice and make cards come out a certain way just to get some people hooked into gambling. He'll make slot machines pay off. And once that gets that, once they think that they're really good and they can get their, their living out of this, they're in bondage. And once, at a certain point, the bondage is so tight that they have no will of their own. And I think that's when devils come in. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, right there, he's, I think Jesus is telling you how it works. And it doesn't have to be with law of attraction or witchcraft or Satanism or, you know, going through wizardry or, or all the occult arts. It could be literally anything. It could be alcohol. It could be drugs. Even some prescription drugs that are abused. It could be adultery and fornication. Pornography. Different types of bondage like that. Where the devil can get you bound. And so bound. That you no longer have a will of your own. They just arrested who they think is a serial killer. Down south, he has worked, he works as a border agent. And they've got him nailed to about four or five serial murders. He's been grabbing prostitutes and killing them. And the fifth one he got, got away and turned him in. Okay? That guy's got a devil. That guy is in bondage. And this devil or these devils are compelling him to do these things. See, devils are murderers too. Okay? And that's what I think is going on with some of these serial killers. I don't think it's a psychosis. I think their life is so full of devils, they literally have no will. Who remembers uh, the son of Sam? Remember him? Ber uh, was it David Berkowitz was his real name? Since being in prison... He also was converted to Christianity, and he said that's the, the reason why he was called the son of Sam was Sam was telling him what to do. Sam was a spirit telling him to perform these murders, and he was doing what Sam told him to do. Why? Because of his weakness, these devils were able to bind his strong man, his will. And once he's bound, he doesn't, have, he doesn't get to tell the devils what he wants to do and what he doesn't want to do. They make him do these things. Okay? So, underline verse 29. And then verse 30. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So let me tell you, my friends, be careful about your weaknesses. 
Devils try to bind your strong man, your will. Once they do that, you've lost control. So I, I just warn and recommend to everybody. Everybody's got their weaknesses. Everybody's got their thing. Fight it. Don't let them take control. You, don't, you, will, not, you will not like how it turns out. See, devils always start by giving you the pleasures of your desires at first. That's how they get you. But then after a while, the pleasures turn into compulsions, and you can't stop. Dangerous world out there, people. Dangerous world. That gives us a glimpse, then, of how these devils get into people. they got to bind their strong man, and it's usually done through their weaknesses, through their lusts, their desires, whatever it is. All right? Let's stand for prayer.